Namaste. So let's continue with Vichara Sangraham. In the next sutta, which is kind of long, three parts, is about the mind and how we can transcend the mind to attain self-realization. Devotee. While there are different modifications of the internal organ, that is, manas, reflection, buddhi, intellect, citta, memory, and ahankara, egoity, how can it be said that the destruction of the mind alone is release? Maharshi, in the books explaining the nature of the mind, it is thus stated, the mind is formed by the concretion of the subtle portion of the food we eat. It grows with the passions, such as attachment and aversion, desire and anger. Being the aggregate of mind, intellect, memory, and egoity, it receives the collective singular name mind. The characteristics that it bears are thinking, determining, etc., since it is an object of consciousness, the self, it is what is seen, inert. Even though inert, it appears as if conscious because of association with consciousness, like a red-hot iron ball. It is limited, non-eternal, partite, and changing, like wax, gold, candle, etc., it is of the nature of all elements of phenomenal existence. Its locus is the heart lotus, even as the loci of the sense of sight, etc., are the eyes, etc. It is the adjunct of the individual soul thinking of an object. It transforms itself into a mode, and along with the knowledge that is in the brain, it flows through the five sense channels, gets joined to objects by the brain, that is, associated with knowledge, and thus knows and experiences objects and gains satisfaction. That substance is the mind. Even as one and the same person is called by different names according to the different functions he performs, so also one and the same mind is called by the different names, mind, intellect, memory, and egoity, on account of the difference in the modes, and not because of any real difference. The mind itself is of the form of all, that is, soul, God, and world. When it becomes of the form of the self, through realization, there is release, which is of the nature of Brahman. This is the teaching. So this sutra covers quite a bit of ground. Let's unpack it because there are some examples that many people might not be familiar with. So the first point is that mind is not one thing. It's an aggregate. <clears throat> It's an aggregate, that means a collection of different things. And these things are delineated by function. You have thinking, memory, intellect, and so on. And these different functions, especially egoity or, or false ego, ahankar, are what blocks self-realization. We are taught from a very early age that knowledge is really important. But from our viewpoint, from the viewpoint of self-realization, knowledge is the booby prize. Because knowledge is never the thing known. It's just a symbol, 
a metaphor, a pointer, if you will, to that thing. Knowledge is always knowledge about something. It is never the thing itself, just like the map is different from the territory. Knowledge is never exactly alike to the thing that it describes. There's always some discrepancy, if only the fact that knowledge is never a complete description. It's always limited to some degree. Now, in the second part, he gives some examples. He says, even though the mind is inert, it appears to be conscious because of association with consciousness, like a red hot iron ball. And this is a reference to an example given in the Upanishads, that even though a red hot iron ball is not fire, it can act like fire and set things on fire, for example, or burn because of its association with fire in the past. So even though we may take the red hot iron ball out of the fire, it can still possess so many qualities of fire by its association. And the same is true of the mind and, by the way, the body as well. So it appears to have consciousness. It appears to have various functions, even though it's actually inert and dull. And this is because of its association with consciousness. It reflects consciousness like a mirror reflects an image. And that's also the meaning of this other example. It is changing like wax, gold, candle, etc. What this means is that gold originally is in the ground as a mineral. Then it's taken out and refined and made into various objects like jewels, jewelry, uh, gold bars, coins, or whatever. But that is still the same gold that was in the ground. And later on, when those objects are destroyed, it goes back in the ground again. So, in other words, the substance gold is different from the objects like jewelry and coins that are made from it. And similarly with wax, wax can be formed and sculpted into many forms, but it's still fundamentally shapeless. So in the same way, the mind has no form of its own. But whatever it comes in contact with, it adopts that form like a mirror, <clears throat> like a mirror. A mirror has no form or color in itself. But when you put something in front of it, it adopts or reflects the color and form of its object. That's the mind. And the difference between the mind and consciousness is that the mind is inert, fundamentally dull. <laughs> it's just matter. It may be very sophisticated, it may be very complicated, but still in the end, just like a computer, they talk about artificial intelligence, but actually the computer has no intelligence. It's only reflecting the intelligence of the programmer. So in the same way, the mind reflects some of the qualities of the self, and thus it appears to have those qualities, but actually they're only reflections. And then he goes on and says, It's an adjunct of the individual soul thinking of an object. It transforms itself into that object. So the usefulness of the mind comes from the fact that it can transform itself into anything. And we can use it to model the reality and understand the different functions of the world and how things work.
And in this way, we can come to understanding and realization of the nature of the world. But we should not get hung up on the mind. The mind is not an end in itself. Just like a tool may be used by a carpenter or other craftsman to make some useful object. But the tool is not useful in itself. It's only useful insofar as it can help to construct a useful object, such as a piece of furniture or something like that. In the same way, the mind is very good a uh, tool for understanding the world. But that doesn't mean we should get hung up on the mind or knowledge as a thing in itself. Knowledge can be useful. It can help our quest for self-realization. But there's a point at which we have to transcend knowledge and come to self-realization itself. And he talks about that in the third part. He says, the mind is called by different names according to its function. So those functions, whether it be thinking or memory or modeling or perception or egoity, the sense of identity, are only useful insofar as they support the function of self-realization. And when the mind comes to resemble the form of the self, to model, as it were, or reflect the self without distortion, then its purpose is achieved in full and one attains enlightenment. So we can understand the mind is a very useful tool. It can help us along the path if it's given right knowledge. Then it can assume the form of the path, model the path, and we get to understand how everything works. And this is very important. I was just chatting with a friend of mine about how I had a first spontaneous awakening in 1967, actually in the midst of an LSD trip. That was the summer of love. <laughs> and there was good... Sandoz and Owsley LSD floating around San Francisco. It was very easy to obtain. These days, very difficult. So in those days, it was very easy. And I was taking LSD with other people or sometimes alone. And I must have taken, I don't know, a couple dozen of trips. And on one in particular, all alone in the middle of the night, like now, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I had an inner experience of Brahman. I didn't know what, would, what was going on. Yes, I had read in books on yoga about the impersonal absolute and Brahman and the light and all these things, but it was not sufficient information for me to model the actual function of it. So when it happened to me spontaneously, I was like surprised. Well, what is this? You know, it was wonderful. But as soon as I came down from the LSD, it was gone without a trace. And for years, I was in denial about it because I couldn't understand what it was. It wasn't until much later that I got the knowledge that enabled me to model what happened. And as soon as I did, then I went into serious meditation. And within not too long a time afterwards, I had the next enlightenment experience, which was first path. And that really set me on the road to complete enlightenment. So one should cultivate the mind by giving it good knowledge, knowledge from the scriptures, knowledge from the realized beings, and then contemplate that knowledge. Think it over. 
How can it be correct? Even when we are told really hard to accept things like there is only one jiva, only one individual soul, or that everything in life is determined completely by karma and there is no such thing as free will or choice. These are very difficult to swallow because we've been conditioned with a different understanding by modern psychology and the philosophy of individualism and so on. But if we think them over sufficiently, we can see that actually these are the truth. And that would open us up for the experience of the truth, which is directly complete enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.